Outrocast. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. I can see you. And thankfully, I can read you due to this Perfectly. wonderful, wonderful book. Miles, how is your day going so far? So far, so good. So far, so good. Before you got on the line, I was just telling the people listening and watching what an inspiration you are, because you're not one of these people who just has one success or one job title. We can say music business executive and manager. We could also say film producer. That's not something that people often know or associate about you. I'm going to put out the word humanitarian. Are you okay with that one too? <laughs> well, I, well, I'd like to think I'm a humanitarian, but of course, you know, that, I guess it's in the eye of the beholder, correct? Yeah, the eye of the beholder, the eye of the tiger. So we here got a lot of questions submitted by people watching this now, watching this later. I also have some things that I want to know. So if you're ready for a bunch of questions that are disorganized and not in any semblance of an order, we will throw them at you. Just throw them. Okay. The first thing then, this one is from me. We are dialing in from Long Beach, New York on Long Island. And one of the first police tours of the U.S., if not the first one, I know played in neighboring Lido Beach at a club called Malibu. Any chance you were there for that or you were ever in Long Beach, New York? I was in Long Beach. Yeah, I can't remember all of the shows, but anything around New York, I definitely would have been at. Um, both for Squeeze and for for the police early days. I mean, I think the first show the police did in, in the in the area was at CBGB's. Uh, we also did My Father's Place. We did various other clubs. But, you know, in the early days, you know, the police were not particularly well in the first tour. They weren't known at all. I mean, they they weren't even supposed to be in the United States. And actually the record company had told us, what are you doing here? Go home. You know, they, I was actually almost thrown out of the A&M office when I showed up at the police because the record was not released. They, they were not financing the tour and it was sort of not done, you know? And I just said, look, you know, come and see the group. It's your group, you know, come and experience it and have fun, you know? And they were like, yeah, sure. Get out of here. We're not, we're not giving you any money. So that was my yeah. first experience, but I can't remember all the clubs we played. I remember the Rat Club in Boston and, you know, some of the other clubs, but uh, there were so many of them that I, you know, they're, they're a bit of a, a bit of a haze. I can only imagine. So, and you raise a really good point there about getting in the face of the record company and that becoming one of the reasons why they prioritize the band. Because the other day I was talking about Oasis with somebody. And they were saying, why weren't they so big after the second album in the States, but big elsewhere? And it could be, hey, the manager did not get in the face of the label and go, hey, we're here. Or they didn't have the presence in the U.S. And you always made it a uh, part of your M.O. to remind everyone that you were alive. <laughs> your artists were making great music and you were the, the biggest cheerleader there was. Yeah, I think that's really the, the job of a manager. So. You know, you look at a lot of the acts and, you know, the ones that made it or the ones that failed or whatever. And, you know, everyone has, you know, in some cases, it was the manager that was a key factor. In some cases, there was one member of the band. Uh, it was some lucky journalist, you know, that happened, you know, in the case of Bruce yeah. Springsteen, a journalist writes an amazing article. And, of course, he ends up being the manager. Yeah. Um, and you, you never know where that that. Uh, something is going to happen that is going to make your career happen. And that's part of what I was saying in the book is that, you know, you can't be too proud. And when people look at me and they say, you know, what, what's the most important show you ever did? And they would imagine I'd say something like, you know, Shea stadium in front of 80,000 people or whatever, you know, and I would say, no, no, no. The best and most important show the police ever played was actually the smallest audience ever. There were four people in the audience. It just so happened one of them was a DJ who then started banging the record. So it just goes to show that you can never be too sure. You know, the reality is it could be somebody in the audience that could change your life. You never know. So you always got to do your best, you know, and that, that's part of the, you know, when I wrote the book, a lot of what I was trying to do was encourage people to think beyond you know, this, the normal, oh, this is, you know, what I did and oh, aren't I great? And, you know, I discovered this act and that act. What I wanted to do was to really learn from the mistakes that I made and from, you know, things that I learned along the way. 
sort of as an inspiration or motivational book. And, you know, one of those things was, you know, four people. I mean, in most groups would have walked out, looked at an audience of four people and said, the hell with it, we're not playing. The police went out and said, you know, those four people bought tickets. They don't know who the hell we are. Let's give them a great show. And they did. They did. And, and it just so happened that that DJ was so enamored with them after that, that he became a super fan. And that's all it took. Yeah, that one DJ in the crowd probably led to hundreds of other DJs picking up that single and the rest is history. So the first question that comes from a local here from Joseph G, he said, I think you literally changed music as we know it and I thank you. No, that's not the question. That's just the first of many compliments to come. So Joseph G wants to know, as far as the police, were there any moments that you did not think that they were destined for global success? He said also that from all the videos of that era, you appear to be their biggest fan and possibly the greatest manager as well. Well, you know, I think when you're in the midst of something, you're not planning. I mean, I, I didn't start off thinking, OK, I'm going to make this the biggest band in the world. Of course, you say that for every group, basically. You know, you say, OK, look, we're, we're going to go for it, you know. But along the way, a number of things can happen. The group can shoot themselves in the foot. The you get unlucky with something, you know, who's to know, basically. But you start off and you're committed to, you know, take it to the next step. It's like it's like in baseball. You know, you get up to the bat and your first thing is, to, OK, I got to get the first base. That's the first thing I got to do. You right. know? Then when I'm at first base, I can think about second base. When I'm at second base, I can think about third. Then I can think about home. But you rarely get up and you think, well, OK, this is a home run, you know your first job is to get the first base, you know? So I think that's sort of where I came into the situation is to say, look, you know, I mean, for me to sit back, I mean, I, I would be too arrogant to be able to say, well, this group is going to be the biggest band in the world. I mean, my view was we're going to go for it. We're going to be big. How big? I'm not going to make the prediction. I'm just going to go for it. You know? Well, thankfully they did become the biggest band in the world. So, yeah. um, you know, but, you know, do you plan to make that happen day one? I don't think I planned it. I just went, you know, and I, like I said, I, I, my first goal was to get to first base. That's kind of the different approach to Alan McGee, who was basically saying this is going to be the biggest band in the world <laughs> over and over and over again. So I think that proves that some people can make it on modesty and step by step and other people can make it with bold declarations but well you know you can make your bold declarations but uh the, the reality is that whatever it is you've got to go do the work you yeah. know you've got to get out there and and you know one of the important lessons that i i, I say in the book was you know what which applies very much to the police was you know people would say well man it's about the music it's all about the music if you got the music it's going to work and i say well no 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 that's really not the case Number one is you got to get noticed. Then it's about the music. Because if you don't get noticed, I don't care how good your music is, no one's ever going to hear it. So, yeah. you know, you look at the great acts of the years, you know, whether it be Elvis Presley with the sideburns and the pink Cadillac and the wiggling his hips on TV and the, the Beatles with long hair and Elton John with his wild clothes and Lady Gaga with her that, you know, you go down the list and the most outrageous groups are the ones that seem to get attention. You know, mm -hmm. um, I think in the case of the police, the name was was a good name. You know, it yeah. got, you know, people calling it the police. And somebody said to Stuart, why do you call it the police? And he said, because I got thousands of cars around the world advertising my group. <laughs> you know, that's a good line, you know. But the reality was, yeah. you know, to call yourself the police kind of jolted people and people would go, oh, oh. It's so like when I started IRS Records, people would go, IRS, why'd you call it? Because if I'd called it, you know, Melvin Records, who would have cared, you know? Right. But, it, but it was a jolt. It was to make people think. It was to make it memorable, you know? And I think that's really what, but the, the police were memorable. They, they went out there, the three, the three blonde guys, that was also a memorable moment. We, we didn't plan it. But when I saw it, I recognized it. That's the link, link to, to unify them, you know, the three blonde guys, you know. So you're always looking for this something that, that makes you stand out from the crowd. Yeah. And I think that that's all part of getting noticed.
And if you get noticed, then it's okay. Let's let's see what the music is. And thankfully, Sting wrote hits. Well, this next question comes from Eric L. And it is about Sting. And it is kind of about the hits, too. He says, the police would not have made it. Uh, I'm sorry. The police would not have made Sting seem like a great singer and songwriter and musician were it not for the consistently brilliant and creative accompaniment of Stuart Copeland and Andy Summers. This happens to many uncredited or undercredited musicians. Is it fair? And what should be done about it? <laughs> well, the reality is uh it, it, it it's a combination of things that work you know sting on his own wasn't successful when stewart found him and brought him in and they created the police and they brought me in as manager you know who, who's to say was it was it me was it stewart was it sting but certainly sting wrote the hits if he didn't write message in a bottle and roxanne and can't stand losing you and all those every breath you take you know would the band have been as that big well no but by the same token, it took Stewart's energy. It took my whatever what I was doing, all <laughs> those elements. And, you know, I say in the book, I, I had an interesting conversation with Dave Gilmore of the Pink Floyd, where we met one night after one of his concerts where I happened to go. And, and uh, he came with me back to my house and we, we sat and chatted for hours. And he said to me, he said, you know, I reformed the Pink Floyd. Um, and let me tell you the story, because in, in, in the early days of the Floyd, I and Roger Waters used to, you know, we would drive home at, after the show and we would think, you know, if we had better musicians on the drums and the keyboards and, you know, it would just make a better group. You know, we were always bitching about, you know, the, the other players that he said. So, you know, we, and then finally the, the Pink Floyd broke up, you know, Roger went his way. I went my way and I get a new band and I get these great fantastic musicians and I'm selling out a 3000 seater and, and I'm thinking, wow, I'm doing great. You know, of course it wasn't the same as the Floyd selling out 30,000 seats, right. you know, but my manager comes to me and says, Hey, by the way, you're, you know, the pink Floyd drummers in town. And uh, wouldn't it be great if he came out and jumped at your last song, all your fans would love it. And he said, I kind of had a bad feeling about it because, you know, I'd been complaining about the musicianship and, and he said, so I didn't really look forward to it. But then this, the show kind of came to an end and my manager said, OK, the drummer's here. Out he walks and he sits behind the drums and he starts playing. And he said, a funny thing happened. It felt like he put on an old pair of comfortable shoes. All of a sudden, things just seemed right. And he said, it, so it isn't about musicianship. It isn't about, per he says, it's just something that works. And I can't put my finger on it. But he said, you know, that drummer and keyboard player and me and Rod, we it, it just worked. Mm -hmm. And he said, that moment, I thought I'm going to reform the Pink Floyd. So he went back to that drummer and that keyboard player and, you know, and they reformed the Pink Floyd. And now he was selling out stadiums again, you know, but it, that, that just goes to show that sometimes it isn't, you know, do you say, well, you know, Sting was the police. Some people would say that, but then again, you know, Stewart had a major hand in it. I had a major hand in it. Andy yeah. Summers had a, you know, it was really a combination. And you take, like it's like a jigsaw puzzle. You take one picture out, one one piece out. Yeah. And the picture is not complete. Which which piece have you taken out? Which, but it's still a picture isn't quite right. And I think that's part of the message. So you can't always be, you know, something where you say, well, okay, well, let's find what's, what's the essence of made this work. Well, it was a kind of combination of evidences, uh, uh, you know, things that that made it work. And, you know, I think it's kind of a mistake to kind of zero in and think, well, there must be some essential essence that made it work. Well, it was a bunch of essences. Synergy, we can say. And that story yeah. is in this wonderful, wonderful book. We will plug that yet again. <laughs> the, the next question shifts over to the Go-Go's from Peter A. He said, what did you hear in the Go-Go's that originally made you want to sign them? Well, you know, I was always looking for two things. One was the, that the band believed in what they were doing and that there was some sort of gimmick that, to promote them. And I thought, you know, five girls from L.A. who believed in what they were doing and had a good fan base. I mean, how bad could it be? You know, you're thinking, well, it's obviously a winner. Something's happening here. Right. And they were fun. They were energetic. They were charming. The songs were fun. And I looked around the room and I was the only person there who could sign acts. 
And I was thinking, well, where is everybody? You know, this is crazy. Why isn't this group, you know? And I thought, well, it turned out, of course, the reason they weren't signed is because they were all women. And up to that point, you know, there'd never been an all girl group that had a number one album in America that, you know, the Supremes that I did singles and, you know, they were sort of manufactured by Motown or whatever. But the Go-Go's were genuine. They were real. They were their own. They formed, you know, um, and I just thought they were they were destined to be successful. I didn't know they'd go to number one, um, but I certainly didn't stop it from happening. So we we launched the record and we got we went, you know, we we again, it was looking for first base, getting to second, getting to third and home, you know. Of course, in their case, they they put out that record and it became a home run, you know. So for me, I just looked at what I personally liked. I liked them. And I thought they were engaging and fun. And I was not looking over my shoulder to see what other companies were doing. Right. And I think that's why IRS succeeded is because I said, look, if I like it, I can't, I'm not that crazy. Other people might like it too. So let's do it. And as long as the price was right and I could afford it, I would do it. And of course, luckily for me, nobody else was in the room. So when I went to sign the go-go's, they didn't hit me up with like some, we want a million dollar advance, you know, cause I didn't have it. <laughs> so yeah. I think I signed them for some paltry sum, you know, which they were all disappointed with, but it worked out for all of us, you know, and, and luckily I paid, I paid as much as I had and, uh, it was just enough to make a hit record. Well, the credit goes to you on that. And also because a lot of record companies, and this is not a scripted question, this is a compliment, which actually warrants a response. Uh, a lot of labels had an icky vibe, you know, like, oh, we're going with the corporate people. And or you had the artists competing with one another regularly. Yet we did see R.E.M. and the Go-Go's tour together. We did see a Buzzcock song recorded by the Fine Young Cannibals. So you fostered a community of artists, which a lot of labels didn't do at the time. Was there an inspiration for that in particular? Well, I always felt an obligation that if I'm because I was handling more than one group, I mean, I always felt that, you know, for the police, if I could put on an opening act, you know, that would also help them, which the Go-Go's did, mm -hmm. um, that I, I would be winning and helping the police and be helping the Go-Go's. And I, I sort of always felt that I had the obligation to open up as many opportunities for all the different people. And, you know, whether it be Jules Holland, you know, I saw him as a personality and got him to introduce the police on a TV show. And he was the keyboard player in Squeeze, you know, and and but I thought, you know, here's a great personality and, you know, he's going to get the police and it's going to make an interesting show and it's going to help Squeeze, you know. So I always look from the standpoint of, of, of cross pollinating because, you know, that that works, you know, sometimes, you know, I mean, Elvis sang songs that other people wrote for right. the most part, you know, Um and, uh, you know, why, why shouldn't the Defying Young Cannibals record a song written by the Buzzcocks or, you know, and I think that was always some, and that's one of the reasons I, I, I was always really happy with the police is they allowed me to put on whoever I wanted as an opening act. They just said, okay, Miles, you know, you know, if you want to put on R.E.M., fine, do it, you know, put on the Go-Go's, you know. And, you know, we had the cramps open for the police. We had, yeah. you know, scape. We had some pretty wild groups, you know. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think it was always something that actually helped because we were not following the sort of traditional path of, you know, I, if, if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, you know, and it was a matter of if I like it, cool, you know, and the police were at least open to suggestion, you know, so I could come up with some kind of wacko opening act and they would say, sure, why not? You know, when I remember Sting saying to me when I said, look, can, can I think Jules Holland would be a great person to introduce the band on TV and to do the, you know, behind this, the music kind of thing at, you know, the police in Montserrat and Sting said, well, we like Jules. He's a good musician. And yeah, well, yeah, why not? And the fact that they were so open to ideas, you know, was a good thing. And I think that's another lesson that I say in the book is that you sometimes don't know what idea is going to work. So don't just spend your life dismissing ideas, you know, because I've had other artists that I think were probably equally as talented as the police, 
but they would always second guess and, you know, worry about whether their friends are going to like it. Or, you know, I remember some of the musicians go, Oh gosh, well, what are my friends going to say? Oh, is this selling out? Or they would agonize about the decision. And I would say, just get on with it. If we make a mistake, we'll come up with something else, you know, but the police were always like, yeah, why not? Let's do it. You know, they didn't go for every idea, but they went for most of them, you know, and I always found that inspirational because it kept me coming up with ideas for those acts that would always be like, Oh God, gee, gee, I don't know about that. Oh, I I have to think about that. You kind of lose interest in those acts because you know, your ideas just never get used and you'd like to think that you're contributing to somebody's success, you know, which I did with a plea. I mean, Roxanne, they, they didn't think was a hit, you know, I did, you know? Um, so I can look back and say, well, you know, if, if, without me, the police wouldn't have happened, you know, of course, without Sting or without Stewart or without Andy, they wouldn't have happened either. But so I'm not going to claim that, you know, it's because of me, but I was part of, it, you know, and that that's something sure. that you can kind of look back on and say, well, you know, that's that's something that's, you know, you can be proud of. To say the least. Next question from a wonderful patron of the Long Beach Library. And of course, this is being shown by other libraries and television because the world wants to see Miles Copeland 3. You know, the best sequel that there possibly was is Miles Copeland the uh, third. Teresa B. wants to know, was it more difficult to get support for girl bands than the guys? And did you ever have to fight for them to get heard? I believe that is a go-go's oriented question. Yeah, well, I think, you know, Michael Plenn, who was uh, really the, the kind of bulldog championing the the record you know at radio and he used to say to me he said you know a lot of people dismiss them as a gimmick because they're all girls you know he said but you know uh and i just said well look let's just that, that it, it's great music whatever whether it's girls or guys you know and I, I i never had a feeling that women for some reason are disqualified you know if, if a woman was a good bass player let her play bass if if she was a good radio promotion person let her be radio promotion so IRS had a lot of women in it, uh, not because we were women oriented, it's just because we went for the best people that we could afford. You know, sometimes it was women. And in the case of the, go- in the case of the Bangles too, it was all women, you know, yeah. but they were, they made great music too, you know? So I, I think it, it would be true to say that it was tougher with women, at least in the beginning. Um, Nowadays, of course, women are all over the place, you know, as meat singers and, you know. Yeah. um, But I think it it had a lot to do with the Go-Go's and the Bangles and a lot of the bands we worked with um, breaking through and proving that girls could write hit songs, could play hit songs and be hit acts on their own. And not only just as singers, but as guitar players, songwriters and whatever, you know. I mean, I remember my songwriter retreats and here I'm, I'm in the moment in France at, 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 a, at this place. And one of the great songwriters that has come three times was Carol King. You know, she wrote great, great songs, you know, and uh, she proved that, you know, women can write great songs just like men can, you know. So I, ne- I never was one who judged somebody because of the color of their skin or their sex. You know, I like to think I'm, you know, if, if you want to say that makes me a humanitarian, I'll take it, you know, but to me, it was like talent is talent. I don't care yeah. whether they're British or, you know, I, I, I worked with an Italian artist called Zucchero, you know, yeah. it was a great talent. You know, I worked with our Argentinian artists. I worked with artists, well, our Arab artists, you know, Shabmami from Algeria, you know, I put him together with Sting, you know, great art is great art. I don't care where it comes from. You know, to me, it was like, if it's, if it's special and I can afford it, Hey, let's do it. <laughs> the next question comes from Brian S. He said, Reckless Sleepers was a group signed to the IRS label in the late 80s. Do you have any recollections of them or insights into that band? And I know that's a general question, but anything you're comfortable sharing will be fine. Well, there were a lot of acts that, that we sort of got involved with, either because somebody in the company recommended the act. I mean, you know, as you start a label, it, in the beginning, it's it was me. You know, I mean, I signed the Buzzcocks and the Stranglers and all these bands I brought in, you know, the Cramps and the and Chelsea and, you know, all these different groups we brought in. And as over the years, you start adding staff and the staff comes in and go, hey, I'm really a big fan of this act, you know, and you kind of like have to give rope to your own people, you know. So some acts got introduced to the label 
not necessarily because I was choosing them, but because somebody in the company was, you know, right. I mean, Jay Boberg was a big champion of REM, you know, um, I, I said yes to signing them because my brother Ian was pushing them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I depended on Ian to book all the acts. So I, they were going to be signed one way or another. But Jay was a champion of the group. And he kept saying, this is going to be a big group. You know, um, Steve Tannett in London was a big champion of the alarm. You know, and he came to me with the alarm. And I said very simply to him, look, if we can afford to sign them and you think they're good, let's go for it. You know, because if I had said no, you know, you're, you lose your people. You know, so part of a record company is not just the acts you sign, but the people you work with. And I think one of the things I say in the book is that sometimes, you know, you undervalue some of the people you hire. And I think in the case of IRS Records, Michael Plan was a key player and he helped the Go-Go's go to number one. And when we lost Michael Plan as a radio man, I think the label never really quite recovered from that. And, you know, so a label is more than just the head of the company, me, or, you know, the head of radio or whatever. It could be, you know, a combination of people in there. So all it all adds up, you know, and, and um, you know, so reckless sleepers, I don't have any particular memory of. It could have been somebody in the company pushing the act. I don't really know. There were there were those acts that, that were signed because somebody in the company thought we should sign them. And and my my attitude was, well, if you really are a believer, you know, let's go for it. Cool. Next question comes from Grog Zeichner. He said, yes, please use my last name. Uh, you produced the movie. You were one of the producers on Shakes the Clown, which was Adam Sandler's first or second movie. Uh, there's a rumor which Grog wanted to know. Is it true that Martin Scorsese was a fan of this film? I don't know that. But what I do know is, is that the, the movie, the movie was one of those sort of crazy movies where the pitch was, look, this is a movie about screwed up, sad clowns. I mean, it was just the kind of thing that would appeal. You know, you think, wait a minute, clowns that are sad and, and the, you know, mixed up and screwed up, you know, and, and the, the reality was, and I, it's not a movie that I would hold up and say was one of the great films we made. Matter of fact, you know, my wife hates that movie, you know, <laughs> but it was one of those ones where you think, well, it was sort of a nutty idea. What the hell, you know, <laughs> shakes the clown. I mean, it was a it was a nutty idea movie, you know, and and that was the kind of thing we did at IRS. Right. Uh, I mean, the decline of Western civilization with, with Penelope Ferris was a, was another case in point. You know, she rose to become one of the most important women directors of America. And this was her first sort of feature film, you know. So I was very proud to, you know, have, have given an opportunity to Penelope. But we did that with, you know, Billy Bob Thornton and, and Bill Paxton and various others, you know, got their start at IRS Records, at, I, at IRS Media, right. which was sort of a spinoff of IRS Records, you know. So in some ways with the film company, we, we gave opportunities to people who later became big stars. Right. Adam Sandler included, because again, that was his first or second film a couple of years before Billy Madison and the whole Happy Madison takeoff. So, hey, you played some sort of role in the ascent of Adam Sandler. And uh, another name, uh, it pops up in your book. Uh, I guess maybe it's because it got picked up by some of the classic rock kind of sites. The Steven Seagal chapter of your life is, which is a couple of pages of the book. You talk about it in a, in a humorous way. You state what happened. And you do you look back on that one fondly? Or is that just something that you were, you know, writing down stories and went, hmm. Well, Steven happened. Seagal, I don't care whether you're a big fan or not. He's definitely a character. Yes. And, and to me, it was a funny, you know, aside. I mean, I wouldn't say, you know, am I going to hold my hand up and say, well, I was the manager of Steven Seagal and that makes me great. But he was a great character and very funny. So it was, you know, I, I felt that in the book, not only am I supposed to be giving lessons and telling people what I did and hopefully people learn from it and be inspirational, but also you have to entertain, you know, the Hassel Atkins story, you know, the cramps, you know, um, Steven Seagal. There were a lot of those stories that were very funny, but they also have a lesson to them, you know. And Steven Seagal was a, was an interesting character. He was actually a pretty good guitar player, you know. That's the word, yeah. And and 
you know, Sammy Hagar was a friend of mine. And, you know, when I called up Sammy and said, would you put Stephen on? He said, well, if he'll take a thousand bucks, sure, I'll put him on. <laughs> I called Stephen and of course, Stephen, you know, didn't care about the money. He just said, sure. So we, I think we must have spent 20 grand doing that show. You know, he hired a private jet to fly to the show and had me get a bunch of records that he was going to sign. And he got bored with signing records, you know. So, you know, it was just one of those funny things. And he hands me these 45s and, and I'm going like, well, what am I supposed to do with these guns? You know, he said, well, you know, you got to protect yourself, you know. So it was, it was an amusing, you know, we have a lot, there were, you know, believe me, in, in my lifetime working with rock and roll stars, there were a lot of funny stories, you know, and I had to include them in the book to be entertaining, you know, because I wanted people to enjoy the book if they were not just music aficionados, you know, people that were into Iris Records or the police or Sting. I wanted, you know, everybody to be able to read it and then actually find it funny and enjoyable, you know. And I think uh, a lot of those stories did that. Oh, without a doubt, they did. Now, that story kind of happened and got into all the news sites because of the Sammy Hagar connection. Anything Sammy does winds up getting reported on. And then that leads to a bunch of, well, what about David Lee Roth? Was David Lee Roth ever in your periphery in any level? Because there were some years when people didn't know what he was doing per se, but the music industry, he was reaching out to different managers and songwriters and producers. Well, he never called me. Sammy did, but he didn't. <laughs> there you go. So bringing it up to speed here, you never stopped. I th we learned quickly into the book, 10 years before IRS records, you were very busy in the music business. After IRS closed, you were very busy. As you mentioned before, there's the songwriting retreat the, that goes on every year, I do believe, and has yielded at least one number one hit from those sessions right there. Four, four number ones. Four number one hits. The most recent one I was aware of was the country song that went to number one. So the yeah. idea that I'm getting at is Miles has never stopped creating, producing, managing, et cetera. But what are you up to now? Please plug as much as you can besides this wonderful book. Well, I, 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 you know, the other day, Michael Flatley called me up, you know, and he, of course, known it for Lord of the Dance. And uh, I went, I drove actually from, you know, I'm, I'm in the sort of middle, middle of France. And so I drove down to Monte Carlo to meet him. And, you know, I, we got on very well. And he said, look, I, I need some help. I got some big ideas. And I said, well, sure, you know. So that's an idea I'm looking at right now is working with Michael Flatley. And I figure, well, you know, I did a lot of work with dance shows with the, you know, I had this wild idea of making a, a copy of River Dance, which, of course, Michael Flatley started. Yeah. And I did it with belly dancers because I was into Arabic music ever since Desert Rose with Sting, you know. And we did 800 shows in 25 countries with the belly dance superstars. And I learned a lot about the whole dance business, which is a bit bis different than rock and roll. But, you know, there's certain similarities. And, and uh, you know, I, 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 well, one, I learned a lot. And, uh, you know, so I could apply that. So I'm, I'm open to ideas, basically. And it's like I'm, I'm at that point in life where I'm not thinking, well, I want to go manage the next super group. And, you know, whatever just intrigues me. You know, if something calls up and, and, and says, look, I've got this idea. I want to do so and so. And it appeals to me. I'd say yes. You know, but I'm not going out and hanging out at clubs to find the next big group or any of this sort of stuff. So I'm really at that sort of point where, you know, I'll if something excites me, I'll do it. If it doesn't, well, I won't. Interesting. And it seems like rock has taken a back seat to what you're looking for. Am I incorrect about that? Well, I, I'm interested. I mean, I work with um, Steve Vai. Uh, we do have a guitar project, which is kind of guitar oriented, you know, which which has, um, you know, some of the world's great guitar players. Mm -hmm. um, Kenny Wade Shepard. We've been talking to him about doing some stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of open. I still am interested in rock and roll, but I'm also interested in, you know, what's going on around the world. Sometimes some, some music that is happening out of Latin America or um, uh, happening in uh, the Middle East or whatever. There's this interesting music all over the world. And I think that's maybe that's because of my upbringing growing up around the world. You know, you're, it makes your ears sort of open to things. You know, I, I noticed watching Netflix, you know, there's so, some interesting movies now that you can see that are made in Norway for all yes. places. I mean, who ever thought of Norway making a movie, you know, and or, or Denmark or some of these other countries, you know, and you realize, you know, 
there's some really good filmmakers in some of these other countries making shows that are really engaging. All right, maybe it's in a foreign language, you got to have subtitles, but the story is really good, you know. So I, my, that's my view, basically, is, you know, you don't lock yourself into thinking that it's only the United States or England that's going to come up with some good idea or some storyline, you know. There's a lot of these great storylines are going to come out of some weird places, you know. So be open to it, you know. So I think that's part of the message of the book is, you know, be open because you never know where the hit's going to come from or the next thing that's going to excite people, you know. I mean, if you look at the history of Apple computer, people were saying, ah, nobody cares about personal computers. Look at us today, you know, or the cloud or this or that, or, you know, people were talking about space travel or, you know, uh, there's so many things that people dismissed, you know, that actually turned out to be the next big thing, you know. So I think that's really part of my, you know, what I message in the book is, you know, don't be too precious. You, you never know where the next hit is coming from, you know. I mean, my wife started buying Bitcoin and thinking, you know, because we, we were we learned so much. And I, I don't quite get what Bitcoin is all about, but the idea intrigues me, you know. And who's to know? I mean, some people are saying, well, Bitcoin's going to be, you know, worth a thousand dollars. You know, well, hopefully so, you know, or, you know, or, or, no, sorry, it's worth 42,000 or something like that. I mean, yeah, it's 40 or 50. Keep it's going to be 40 or 50, you know, <laughs> one day it's going to be worth a hundred or 200 or 300, you know, fingers crossed, you know, but you never know, you know, I started collecting old armor, you know, suits of armor, you know, and from some of the great armor makers, you know thinking well one day these guys are not going to be making armor anymore and you know the price will go it's like old painters you know a lot of the great painters who ended up you know dying penniless ended up making paintings that were selling now for 150 200 million you know right so like i say you know what what's what's strong today could be weak tomorrow and what's weak today could be strong tomorrow so you never be too proud you know you never you never know I usually end my discussions or interviews by saying any last words for the kids, but you just kind of did that. And this book is essentially any last words for the kids. So instead, I'd like to kind of say, it sounds like you have no regrets that you're happy with where you want to be. And there's nothing that you're looking at in your career where you go, hmm, I should have done that differently because it got to where you are now. Well, I, you know, I mean, there are certain less, I think anybody who says you wouldn't have done something a little bit differently, you know, is lying, basically. I mean, there were certain things, you know, I mean, I, I talk about it in the book, you know, one of my favorite groups was Duran Duran, you know, and I actually, I signed a management contract with them. I was the manager of Duran Duran officially signed contract, legally, everything cool. And then we went to dinner and they asked me, you know, what kind of advance they could get. And I knew if I told them the truth, it would not fly very well. So I decided to lie. And I said, well, we're going to get $2 million. I think that's a target we could reach, you know? And I, I, the truth was, I, I think that I was pushing it maybe seven or $800,000 is more like it, you know? And, uh, the whole, as I say in the book, you know, the, the tenor of the, of the, of the dinner we had, the celebration dinner just turned black, you know? And the next day, the, the, the accountant calls me up and says, Miles, uh, the group's very unhappy with uh, uh, what you said. And uh, um, they think they got the wrong manager. And I went, you mean they saw through my lie? They realized I was lying to them and I was a bullshitter? And they said, well, no, they, they uh, actually, they were disappointed that you only said $2 million. I, I said, what? I said, I lied to $2 million. I said, what did they expect? He said, well, they hoped you'd said 5 million. And of course they ended up getting 800,000 like, like they should have gotten, you know, the, but the point was, is that, is that I didn't lie big enough, you know, and, and if I had lied, I would have been the manager of Duran Duran today, you know, and, and, you know, it's a, that, so would I have gone back and lied bigger? Well, I probably would have, you know, um, and there are a couple of points like that, you know, over the years, you know, were certain acts that did I sign that, you know, maybe I shouldn't have or, you know, certain acts that, you know, there's always something, you know. Um, but for the most part, yeah, I mean, you know, the book was kind of cathartic in the sense that, you know, you could see well, all the things you did and 
you realize you did make mistakes, but you also had successes. And it's that's all part of the game. Basically, you're going to make mistakes. That's part of the, 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 the title of the book, two steps forward, one step back. So, all right, you're going to take two steps forward. You know, that's good. But you're going to have those steps backwards, too. You know, those are going to happen, too. And, you know, that's part of life. That's part of learning. That's part of, you know, I, I think with the case of the police, we, I used to say, yes, we made mistakes. But by the time somebody discovered a mistake, we'd had two more successes. So the success never dragged us back, you know. Uh, sorry, the, 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 the failures never dragged us back because we always had successes to, to, to play off of. And I think that's really it. Just be positive and move forward, you know. I mean, what can you do? But I think that one of the best lessons of all was that really I went with my gut, you know. Look, do I like it? If I like it, it must be good. Why do I need to look over my shoulder and see what everybody else likes? Yeah. You know, why do I have to, well, do you like it? Well, no. Do you like it? I say, well, <laughs> I like it. I really love it. It's great. Therefore it must be great. You know, all I need to do is find the people like me who think like me, not everybody is, but there's enough of them that do. And thankfully in the case of the police and Jules Holland, the squeeze, REM, finding cannibals, go-go's, bangles, you know, there were enough people out there that thought like I did and liked what I liked and bought the records and we had hit records, you know, and, and uh, I mean, e even guys that, you know, I mean, guys like Keith Urban, who's like a big superstar now, you know, he came to the Sat Castle songwriting retreat, you know, declaring that he wasn't good enough guitar player. You know, I, I forced him to come here. He met, the people that he, he met the two Go-Go's who he ended up writing the number one song with, you know? And uh, so I had a role to play in Keith Urban. So I, I, I look back and say, well, you know, I had a hand on a lot of people, even if it, if it wasn't, you know, in the case of him, I introduced him to the Go-Go's, which he never would have met had he not been here. So yeah. I, you know, I, I played a role in Keith Urban becoming the, the top country artist, you know? And, you know, as a lot of those sort of things, you know, you put your finger on, you know, what worked, what didn't work. You know, there were other times that you put people together and nothing happened, you know, but I think with people like William Orbit, who became a superstar with, with, you know, I, I, I was his first, I, I recognized him as a producer yes. before anybody else and had him before produce Madonna. records. Yes. And, and then he did Madonna and became a superstar. And now he's sold something like 200 million records or something. So I'm proud of people like William Orbit and Jules Holland and, Sting and the police and the Go-Go's and the Bangles and Fine Young Cannibals and R.E.M. and all these bands, you know, I'm proud to have been, in, you know, part of the, the cog that helped their machine happen. Well, with regard to bringing up Duran Duran, I apologize for spotlighting the one not success of the 25 global, eternal, perpetual successes you've had. So <laughs> thank you so much for your time, Miles. Thank you for your contributions to culture as a whole and really looking forward to everything you keep delivering in the near future. Well, I appreciate it and uh, hope your show does very well. And uh, if you think of any more questions and you ever want to talk again, I've always, I love to talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> and man. I got Have the time to talk. So just call anytime. Looking forward, man. Have a great rest of the day there out in beautiful France. Okay. Take care. Take care. Outro cast. <laughs>